Glory to the Holy Trinity, Callum McCritchie here, and let's have a video looking at the Oscars of 2023. You know, a lot of people would um, be skeptical that this kind of list wouldn't be improving anything, for reasons I'll, I'll explain, but given the, um, the lineup, um, I mean, with some exceptions, I mean, there's probably going to be some films here that are may or may not be a, posit a more positive turn in the right direction for Hollywood's reputation. On the one hand, yeah, there might still be a few films that lean in the direction of the political propaganda and pandering. But on the other hand, from if you look at it, things closely, I suppose there are some uh, legitimately good films getting the rightly deserved rewards. But anyway... There are some things I just want to say right out of the, the gate, given the content on my channel. Like, I've had some critiques on um, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, and how it wasn't fully um, consistent with its um, overt themes and uh, its sense of theology. But um, all that... And uh, the film Bruce and Bruce's Last Wish had a better presentation of uh, villains and a uh, story structure and the Pinocchio had its problems with its musical numbers but there's no denying that there's this intricate passion put into the stop motion animation that went into Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio um, there's so much uh, Interesting themes like how the blue fairies are presented as like biblically accurate angels, as if to say that um, the uh, like there is some answer to prayer in in the depiction of this film. And there's other themes like how um, it handles loss and father son relationships, and how it's I find it fascinating how they. Del Toro chooses to depict his own version of Pinocchio, a story about handmade puppets with literal handmade puppets that he moves frame by frame. It's taken four years to make. It took him a long time to see this passion project done. It got released on Netflix. And one thing I will applaud Guillermo Del Toro for is promoting the fact that animation is art. So I know a lot of people are upset that Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, didn't get the nomination, but let's be honest. Even if Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, is the better film, which it is, let's be honest. Guillermo del Toro, bigger name, more recognized filmmaker in the Academy, of course he was going to win this. Um, but, I mean, I mean, it's Guillermo del Toro. I mean, when you have a name like that, it's akin to trying to compete with someone like um, Hayao Miyazaki. Or uh, Pete Docter, in, if he was uh, directing. Like, um, those kind of filmmakers, they understand animation as not just as a medium for families, but as a legitimate work of art. And one thing, one thing I highly admire Guillermo del Toro for, um, even though I might not agree with everything he thinks and says, he is promoting the fact that animation is not just a genre. It's not just for kids. It is a work of art. I've only seen like a fraction of this already, I must admit. Um, I didn't get the chance to see this nomination, but I was pleased to see that uh, here that this was actually the first nomination. So I think people are starting to take animation more seriously again. And I've had there's people online, like Schaeferless Productions, who uh, are very... Um, much complaining about how animation isn't really taken as a serious art form and I mean the thing is uh, the Academy has a very restricted to what animation is capable of because most of what the West has is just um, kid stuff animation that it's more easy to appeal to children with animation so they just see animation as kids fodder but what they don't realize is that there are passionate storytellers like in Japan and um, other places around the world, and even in America, who are willing to use animation 
um, to make stories aimed for older audiences and use their animation not as a way to pander to children, but as a way to enhance the way they're trying to tell the story. It's like um, a moving artwork. It's um, Arts and crafts have been endorsed in the right way in the past as well as telling stories, so combining the two should make for a great blessing, logically speaking. I don't see anything logically wrong with, like, moving artwork, so, especially if it's aimed for an older audience, you know? So let's see Guillermo del Toro get his nomination. Animation is cinema, animation is not a genre, and uh, animation is ready to be taken to the next step. We are all ready for it. Please help us. Keep animation in the conversation. There you have it, everybody. Guillermo del Toro, one of the most renowned filmmakers in the Hollywood business. The same man responsible for the much analyzed filmmaking um, darling, should I call it? <laughs> that is Pan's Labyrinth. The same man who made another film that the, the Academy Awards really liked, called The Shape of Water, that man declares that animation is cinema. Not just a genre. This is exactly the kind of thing I've been promoting on my channel for a long time. There's a reason why I've been trying to promote stuff like uh, The Prince of Egypt and Samurai Jack. There is a reason why I've been trying to promote animated media like The Prince of Egypt and The Red Turtle and Samurai Jack and there is a reason why I've been trying to promote animated media that could be taken as works of art like The Prince of Egypt and The Red Turtle and Violet Evergarden. These kinds of stories are not just kids fodder, they are Stories where the animation actually enhances the presentations of the virtues they're trying to tell and actually uses the visuals creatively to enhance the storytelling they are trying to say. They use visuals in a way that live action can't quite duplicate. You know, films like uh, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. There's a reason why I talk about films like Puss in Boots, The Last Wish and have gone out of my way to make an extensive analysis of Spirited Away, as well as an extensive analysis of The Prince of Egypt, because those stories... There's a reason why, on my channel, I go out of my way to talk about films extensively, like um, the events of scripture as depicted in The Prince of Egypt, albeit with creative liberties. And there's a reason why I depict Spirited Away... Um, this uh, sort of Eastern myth that uses, brilliantly uses its visuals to portray a the the themes of uh, growing up. Um, you know, like, you might not agree with um, the worldviews that um, some of these films promote, but there's values that are deeply, um, that we can all deeply learn from, you know? And... Uh, one of these animations that I've talked about on my channel is the Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse short film. And I am deeply pleased that Charlie Mackesy, this man who's truly doing the Lord's work in a brilliantly humble way, I think, he won for Best Animated Short Film for his animated adaptation for the Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. He has earned it. Let's take a look at some of his uh, promotional... Uh, stuff in light of this. You are enough. That was one of the top quotes from that film. Just, you are loved, you are enough. I mean, I think. That man's earned it. Like, he, his story has touched so many people during the pandemic. And uh, it's touched many more people this, this last Christmas. Um, I just had to talk about it on my channel. And um, some of the, my videos relating to this specific story has seems to be um, some of the videos that gets the most views on my channel. So <laughs> there's that. 
So, Charlie McAsee, in the unlikely event that you happen to be watching this, <laughs> holy trinity, bless you. You are doing amazing. I think if more people could aspire to do make stuff like what you're doing, this world would honestly be a better place, honestly. So, now that I've talked about how animation as a whole is, um, for the most part, moving in the right direction. Oh, there's some other things I just want to mention. Um, <laughs> rest assured, my friend Brooks Gallinghouse, Turning Red did not get Best Animated Feature. <laughs> All right, let's talk about everything else. Um, <laughs> talk about everything else. Or more like, talk about everything, everywhere, all at once else. <laughs> sorry, sorry. The the way the words were coming out. <laughs> okay, so... Um, um, I know there's some people who say, oh, you, you, you'd wish that um, uh, some of these films from the animated categories would win um, some other categories like Best Picture and Best Screenplay like they did in the past with Spirited Away and Toy Story and Beauty and the Beast. But um, regardless, um, some of the films that have been getting most attention, which should be a surprise to few people if they've been paying attention to movies and general reactions this year, um, there was, um, for better or for worse, <laughs> Everything Everywhere All at Once. There was the brilliant adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front. I've got a friend who disagrees with me on that, but hey-ho. Um, and there was also... Um, I mean, those two films were getting the most attention, but there were a few others. Uh, oh yes, Brendan Fraser got the best actor for uh, The Whale. Yeah, Brendan Fraser was just one of those actors who kind of just uh, sort of stepped out of the limelight. like Kind of like... Um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. and the, the Muppets, you know, they, they go through their period where they don't really feature in many Hollywood blockbusters, but then they make a return, and when they make a return, they really hit home with audiences, uh, apparently. So, well done, Brendan Fraser. You managed to uh, immerse yourself um, in this big bodysuit for this heart-endearing performance. Now, just keep in mind, I admittedly have not seen all the films here and um it would probably be unfair for me to say this but i haven't seen or nor have i actually heard of okay i've probably heard of this one um but i don't think i've ever um seen a any of these so I, I wish i had enough time and resources to do that sort of thing but hey oh a man can dream um what else is there to talk about? Um, uh, Brendan Fraser got himself in really convincing a practical uh, event and seems to have touched many people's lives. Um, what else is there to talk about? Um, now, the film Everything Everywhere All at Once, I can't imagine it being everybody's cup of tea, and perhaps not everybody will agree with this sort of worldview that it promotes. Um, it talks a lot about the concept of the multiverse, and it has a few nihilistic ideas and um, probably promotes some dangerous behaviors. But I am someone who sees everything um, fairly, so everything everywhere all at once is a film. I can definitely see why a lot of people like it. It's, um, it makes the most of the concept. It's an extremely crazy film. I mean, one of the craziest films of the year. I, I think I'm probably going to make a video later on in this channel. Um, now, admittedly, the film Everything Everywhere All at Once is a film that promotes some nihilistic ideas and some dangerous behaviors. So, I wouldn't call it one of the best films ever made. With that said... I can understand why people adore it. There, there is undeniably a lot of passionate ambition put into this uh, film from another country. It just goes to show that people from other countries seem to be making better quality entertainment than modern Hollywood these days. <laughs> um, so Everything Everywhere All at Once, the film that handles the concept of the multiverse far better than a Marvel movie which has the word multiverse in it, which is uh, funnily ironic in a way. <laughs>
It's kind of like that line from Game of Thrones, like, if you pronounce yourself as king, you're no king. <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. Everything, everywhere, all at once better personifies the Multiverse of Madness than the actual film called Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> um, and I must say, uh, compared to the Doctor Strange film, um... I meant to say I haven't seen it, but from what I've heard, everything everyone all at once has far better character writing. Um, I, so I can see why the support, the um, the main actress, the supporting actor, and the supporting actress uh, won their respective awards. Again, even if the um, the film promotes some dangerous philosophies and ideas, um, and for as much dangerous ideology as like everything everyone all at once uh, has. One thing I will definitely agree with is the fact that Everything Everywhere All at Once won for best editing. There is this one edited shot in the entire film where it's just the face of the main actress. And yet, due to the concept of the multiverse, we see all these different versions of her go from like and then off to mere milliseconds and like every single uh, frame these, ah, like, tens, possibly a, a hundred or maybe more frames. It's probably less than that, but it was like, it felt like, like, a hundred or so frames just all flashing through with this, um, burn me, I farted. Burn me, I farted again. All this, um, edited, um, Flashing of the main actress's face, and she has all these different looks, these different costumes, different designs, all this just going through and through and through and through. And how much effort would it have taken just to have that one shot to have her perfectly aligned and to get the editing in such a way to promote, to, um, not to not promote, that's the wrong word, to, um, showcase the concept of the multiverse that they're trying to uh, create. That one shot alone could probably win for best editing, if you ask me. <clears throat> so, what else is there to talk about? There's All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, I've got a friend of mine uh, saying that he, he prefers the black and white versions. He said that um, the modern version was um, quite... Um, I don't remember... Recall. Was was an inferior to the black and white version. I remember seeing like the seventies version or something like that back at history class. But I actually really liked the um, All Quiet on the Western Front film. I, it's quite a powerful and poignant film about um, the deception of. <coughs> Sorry, Father Son, Holy Spirit, please forgive me if I get this wrong. Help me, Christian, just the man. So about All Quiet on the Western Front, um, that was quite a provoking film about how um, people with political agenda can um, trick naive people into thinking one thing about reality, only for like reality and the the existence of like uh, moral absolutes and the terrors of war will then slap these kinds of people in the face and just uh, all the pain, all the suffering that goes along with it. And now we can debate as to which version of All Quiet on the Western Front is, but honestly, I think the cinematography is great. There's just these... I love the big, wide still shots. Like, I think it's, it must be something about the choice of aspect ratio. Um... I love those kinds of wide shots. It really gets you to see just how big the scenario is. Like, I love those kind of camera shots. It's like something out of like Lawrence of Arabia. Everything, sorry, All Quiet on the Western Front is a film that showcases how brutal the reality can be when um, naive people are exposed to this this kind of um, anti human political agenda that um, tries to um, sugarcoat certain things and uh, only for this harsh, factual, moral reality to slap people in the face for falling for such a naive 
ideology and we see the horrors of war and we get this really tragic yet poignant ending about just how futile war is. Again, we, we can debate about which um, version is the better version. With All Quiet on the Western Front, I can see why it won Best Cinematography. I just love those big, wide aspect ratio shots where it's like you're looking at a canvas at times. And especially when it's so still, it's like looking at epics like Lords of Arabia where they make the landscape wide on purpose just to show how big everything is. Like, I'd love to see biblical epic style filmmaking again where um, you have these big wide shots just to see how big everything is. That would really get you to see like the bigger picture of things. Best makeup and hair, well, I uh, mentioned earlier. Best costume design, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Now, I've critiqued that film and <sighs> um, the Oscars were doing this thing where they would promote Black Panther Wakanda Forever like it's the, like Golden Calf or something. <laughs> Pardon me. I farted and I burped. And Pardon me. I will edit this bit out. Uh, uh, uh. Now, Black Panther Wakanda Forever winning for best costume design. Yes, the costume design was one of the only good elements of that film. <laughs> I mean... I, I wouldn't say Black Panther Wakanda Forever is, like, the worst film I've ever seen. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean there are some good qualities to Black Panther Wakanda Forever. It, it pales in comparison to the first one. But even then, the first one had its flaws. Like, the CGI, I mean, I mean the visual effects, uh, for the most part, were superb. But sometimes it was kind of awkward, in, especially in the final fight scene, where it looked more like... Uh, PlayStation 3 fight scene or, or even or even a highly rendered PlayStation 2 fight probably PlayStation 3 yeah probably looked more like a PlayStation 3 fight scene than an actual high budget Hollywood um, fight scene at least in that first film um, <clears throat> with Wakanda Forever I can see why it could touch so many people with um, uh, paying homage to Chadwick Boseman um <coughs> And um, I can understand the sentiment in that regard. Um, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Hollywood, I'm going to be honest with you. You already have so much diversity in the vast span of your films. Don't you think it's odd that modern Hollywood in the name of diversity, prioritizes the um, showcasing of African Americans above not just the white people, but also <laughs> above all the other um, possible minorities. Like, there's a specific emphasis on, like, the African people. Um, no, that's probably not going to be right. The man. With Black Panther Wakanda Forever winning winning Best Costume Design, yeah, I, I can see why it won for Best Costume Design. There's um, uh, some homages to African culture, and I really like the costume design, actually, how they wore white for their funerals, because there are some countries that wear white rather than wearing black during their funerals, because different cultures associate different colors with uh, death. Um, I wonder if there's any cultures that were grey. Anyway, regardless, um, <clears throat> there's some other great costumes, like, um, the cultures and the technology, so it's safe to say that the costume design was one of the only good elements of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I mean, I critiqued that film, but it's not entirely without merit. I can understand the sentiment of paying homage to Chadwick Boseman. And the difficulties of having to write a script um, with in Chadwick Boseman's uh, absence, I think maybe it probably would have been more sensible if they replaced Chadwick Boseman with somebody else. I mean, they did it with War Machine. Why not do the same with Chadwick Boseman and pay homage to him in some way? I mean, on the one hand, 
we do get some genuine emotional moments during that movie. But on the other hand, it's only during the beginning and the ending of the film. Like, the rest of the film, it's... <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a mess. It's a big mess. Um, I can understand the sentiment of paying homage to Chadwick Boseman. Um, I mean, we should all, like, mourn beloved lost souls. Um, but this um, sentimental, emotional parts involving... Um, Paying homage to Chadwick Boseman only happened in the beginning and the end of the film. So, apart from paying homage to Chadwick Boseman, as well as the costume design and um, any semblance of virtue that the film may promote, Black Panther: Wakanda Forever is a mess of a film, and I mean a mess of a film. There are so many. Inconsistencies with the plot, like um, how on earth does um, the sister of T'Challa survive getting speared um, by the villain when the villain of the previous film, who also had the powers of the Black Panther, got stabbed by this spearhead dagger thing and died? So you're telling me that this physically more imposing man with <laughs> the Black Panther power died of getting stabbed in the chest by a, a spear uh, chest thing. But this young woman <laughs> gets a spear right through her, um, her entire body. And despite some struggles, a few moments later, it's as if it never happened. <laughs> <It's>, and <laughs> there's some pacing issues. There's some. Um, there's other issues like that. Uh, you can call Black Panther kind of forever you want, but perfect it ain't. I'm sorry, someone had to say it. Um, best documentary short: The Elephant Whispers. I've yet to see that. Um, let's see. Best visual effects: Avatar: The Way of Water. Winner. Okay. Duh. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> um, I mean, um, Avatar: The Way of Water. Um, if I were to rate that film, um, even though that film has problems with its writing and characterization, I would still endorse that film over. Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I think uh, that film gets a better idea of culture and things like that than Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Um, hold on a minute. So Avatar The Way of Water. Um, that's a film I haven't really reviewed on this channel, I guess up until now. Um, I would um, say, despite Avatar The Way of Water's trouble with writing and characterization, somehow... <laughs> <laughs> the bland writing and characterization is somehow better than Black Panther Wakanda Forever because with Black Panther Wakanda Forever, they have these previously established characters who are already quite likable, but Avatar's characters were fairly bland in comparison. However, with um, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, they've kind of ruined the reputation of... Uh, certain characters um, due to the way the film was written and um, I've noticed that Avatar The Way of Water seems to be promoting actual virtue um, the specific virtues of um, of traditional values of masculinity and femininity my friend Malaika Ganje God, Holy Trinity bless her has been um, talking about Avatar The Way of Water in a live stream. And she talked about the film specifically because of all the um, the virtues promoted in that film. I mean, it's not done perfectly. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, you'd think for all these years, James Cameron would 
find the de- have the decency of writing a more engaging story. Um, he must have been focusing more on the visuals or something to do with production than the actual story itself. Um, but um, there are values and virtues in Avatar The Way of Water, which I must say are handled far better than Black Panther Wakanda Forever. You see, this is a common mistake that a lot of modern Hollywood films seem to keep making. And um, you'll find that if you align yourself with actual virtue, which aligns with what we perceive to be the divine, then we start to create actual good stories. Something I've noticed about Avatar The Way of Water is that it promotes virtues far better than Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Like, obviously, like, <laughs> they, they, there could be some worldview conflict um, within, like, the context of those films. And you might have some problems with that. But there's something I've noticed about stories. And there's this common problem with modern Hollywood that most of them don't seem to be learning from. Uh, namely because um, people have allowed, um, like, political agenda as well as um, ec- money pandering to get in the way of telling actual good stories that points to actual good virtue. Because if you look at some of the best stories throughout history, these stories have timeless elements to them. And these timeless stories will, in some way or another, have virtues that point to the divine. Those are the kinds of stories that I value. And I'm not the only one who thinks this way. Avatar The Way of Water has poor writing, but I'd say Avatar The Way of Water um, has a better sense of virtue than Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Because, technically speaking, the characters of in the Black Panther franchise are, technically speaking, more well-developed given the previous installments in the MCU via Black Panther and Civil War and uh, the Infinity War and Endgame. So, technically speaking, the characters have already gotten um, caught up with liking these characters, but Black Panther Wakanda Forever kind of ruined their characters to some degree, but not in the worst way. Not, not as bad as Thor Love and Thunder. That movie made me so angry. Um, Black Panther Wakanda Forever definitely suffers because um, this here's the problem that a lot of modern Hollywood films do these days uh, is that modern Hollywood, most modern Hollywood films, they have virtue signaling, but they don't promote actual virtue. That's their problem. You see... Um, Black Panther Wakanda Forever is guilty of doing this thing that a lot of modern Hollywood films are guilty of these days. Films like Black Panther Wakanda Forever, it has virtue signaling in it, but it doesn't promote actual virtue in the way that Avatar The Way of Water does. You see, for example, um, films like Black Panther Wakanda Forever will put up these double standards and these narrative inconsistencies all in the name of this pandering political agenda. So, in the MCU, it's been established that um, that America had been uh, not giving out all their supplies or something like that to people in, in the events of Falcon and Winter Soldier. And yet, in Black Panther Wakanda Forever... Wakanda does the exact same thing of not sharing their provisions, and yet they get away with it. Why? Because they're African. What is with the double standards? Like, whatever happened to what Martin Luther King Jr. said? <clears throat> Pardon me, I farted. <clears throat> Pardon me, I farted again. Please help me. Please forgive me. Help me, Christian Jesus. <clears throat> Pardon me. Please forgive me. Like, whatever happened to being judged by the quality of our character rather than the content of our skin like talk about what jesus christ said about like whitewashed tombs you know <laughs> like the, the, <laughs> like uh, um these uh, propagandists like they parade around like externally uh, trying to show that they're being virtuous 
But what they're actually doing is they, they virtue signal. They don't do actual virtue. Um, like Wakanda in the Wakanda Forever movie keeps having these double standards of how they rule. They get away with things that um, other people have been accused of in like past installments of um, the MCU. Um, there's another scene where <laughs> um, Ironheart um, blows up some policemen. And it's somehow a cheery moment. Yeah, let's go. Let's do this, man. And yet that sort of thing would not be tolerated by other characters in previous installments of um, of the film. And not to mention, oh, this oh, makes me cringe so hard. <laughs> this that makes me cringe. There's a common phrase among the Wakandans that is so cringeworthy. And I'm not just saying this because I'm white. It's, again, it's because of the double standards. Like, the Wakandans keep referring to all the white characters as colonizers. Like, colonizers. I mean, come on. You're... And what's really stupid is that um, it's, it's, it's meant to be played off as a joke. But the way it comes across, especially towards the Martin Freeman character, who's done nothing but help the Wakandans with what little he can. Even for um, the scene in which he was almost pointless in contributing to... I mean, they call this friend of theirs, who's held Wakanda, a colonizer. And I just think, oh, come on. What did he do to deserve this? He's done nothing but help you and serve you. And I mean, this Martin Freeman character helps out the Wakandans and they call him a colonizer. That's like if there was this pale introverted man who spends a lot of his times indoors due to some personal issues or something like that or, or whatever. Um... That's like if he helped me out with something, and then I called him something like ice cream stick, or something like that. You know, that kind of phrase would just, just shows so much ungratefulness, and, and the film goes on like this. The film tries to take itself seriously, but it mostly comes across as virtue signaling rather than actual virtue. But Avatar The Way of Water, on the other hand, even though some may say it has got a troublesome worldview, um, it does a far better job at showing actual virtue. Like, showcasing the actual strengths of femininity, and not just the kind of strong femininity that Hollywood thinks is strong <laughs> uh, femininity. Like, the, the feminism, like to fight equivalent to men. Not just that, but the actual strength in nurturing children and bringing up future generations. That kind of virtue is actually shown. And we actually see the, um, the virtue of... Um, the, the masculine virtues of um, male characters taking responsibility for, um, for their actions. We see characters um, try to make reasonable decisions based on their circumstances. Yeah, the visual effects in Avatar The Way of Water are mwah, beautiful. And um, I'm, I was actually quite pleased to see that 3D glasses made a brief return. And I think they're going to do the same with the Super Mario Brothers movie. And 3D was one of those things where people thought it was going to be a permanent thing, but then... I think it went out of fashion by the time the pandemic hit. I'm, I'm glad to see 3D make a return. I know people don't really like 3D, but I actually do. It, it makes it more immersive. I, I don't see anything wrong with 3D, but I mean, I could be corrected on that. It made the experience much more immersive, and the, the graphics are absolutely stunning. It's very immersive in, in that way. Um, rest of the screenplay. Let's see... And now I get to talk about Top Gun Maverick. And um, I was hoping Top Gun Maverick would win at least an award. Because if there was any movie, you know, apart from Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, apart from Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, 
Okay, I haven't got that much longer. So, Top Gun Maverick. Yes! God bless this film. It's amazing. Dear Father, Son, Holy Spirit, please forgive me if I've done anything wrong. Help me, Christian. Jesus, amen. Top Gun Maverick. Holy Trinity, bless this film. Top Gun Maverick was just one of the films of 2022. And I think it rightly deserves the reward for best sound effects. Honestly, I wish Top Gun Maverick could get more rewards <laughs> just for what it's done to bring people hope that there are still people who care about making good films with no inherent political agenda in mind. Just make a good story with real virtues rather than virtue signaling Top Gun Maverick. Because, I, I, I mean, I would be happy if Top Gun Maverick got Best Picture. I mean, I'm happy that um, All Quiet on the Western Front got Best Picture for the BAFTAs, at least. I mean, I think... Top Gun Maverick should have won Best Picture in the Oscars, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think it should have. <laughs> um, best sound effects. I want to tell you something. If you're going to see Top Gun Maverick, if it gets re-released, then go see it in the cinemas, because there are just some scenes where the way the jet planes kind of move, it really roars right into your chest. Like, there's this one scene where Maverick sneaks up behind his students and um, maneuver where he flies right beside them and then you go, WHOA! So during that scene, if you see it in the big screen, the jet plane goes, Phew! Dear Father, Son, Holy Spirit, please forgive me. I'll be Christian, Jesus, the man. The jet plane just goes, Phew! And you just feel the vibration in your chest and it's just the most incredible experience. Um, Natu Natu. I confess, I've practiced dancing to this song, just in case. I have this Indian friend who really, 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 really does not R R R because um there's a lot of problems with the film, like like how blatant the film could be with the message it's trying to say was like it's anti-colonialism. I mean, um, on the one hand, like, I can understand the, um, like, how people can be abusive in the past, but my friend, who is Indian himself, by the way, I think he's probably the kind of person who would uh, uh, say that there are actually benefits to colonialism, um, if done right, obviously. Um, and uh, he's had a lot of problems with the film about how, like, it glorifies just the utter over the top nature of things. Um, the villains don't really have much depth to them at all. Um, and my friend noted there are a whole history of Bollywood Indian songs. He gave me a whole list of them to listen to. And he's thinking, how come only now Hollywood has been paying attention to songs from India? And he noted it's because the person who made RRR um, has a close link with the government, which is, to my knowledge, the only reason why RRR is getting that much attention to begin with. Um, let's see, what else is there to mention? Uh, well done, Brendan Fraser. Best. Um, yeah, uh, that's all I want to say about the Oscars 2023. Lord, forgive me if I've done anything wrong with this video. What do you think about the Oscar nominations? Let me know in the comments down below. Got a funny conversation started. Hopefully, this will be a turn for the better. Also, uh, Jimmy was quite funny in his comments about celebrities. <laughs> you should go check it out. Holy Trinity, bless you all sincerely. Galvin Critchie signing out. Yeah.